How many identify though that, that sometimes don't, doesn't it feel like there's a, there's a room somewhere, I don't know if it's here or if it's up here, and there's these little munchkins inside you and they, they are pushing all the buttons? I, I, I don't know, but I, I looked at that video and I thought, sometimes that describes my feelings. That describes my emotions. I know that I'm supposed to be in control. I know that I'm supposed to kind of have a handle on my emotions, but sometimes I feel like those little munchkins just running around inside my heart or my head, and it's like, I know I shouldn't be feeling or I should be controlling my feeling, but I can't help it, and all I want to do is smash something. How many, are you with me on that one? Okay, good, good, because I thought there was something wrong with me, but I, but because I just, I've identified too much with that with that cartoon. As we kind of review this idea of abundant living, what we've been looking at uh, over the course of, of this year, the notion that what we think is abundant living and what God thinks is abundant living, what our culture thinks is abundant living is often a different thing. And so we measure God's abundance differently than perhaps God measures his abundance or the way culture might measure it or the way in which we often will expect God to bless us. In other words, we have an idea of what God's abundance should look like in our lives. And we don't articulate it this, but it, it would sound like if I was God, and we're all grateful that I'm not, but, but if I was God, and, and, and you would say the same thing perhaps, this is how I would bless me. Because I know how to bless me. God, you need to get on my page here. Let me tell you how to give your abundance to me because I can tell you that sometimes you're not doing it the way I think you should. You with me now? I mean, because we're the voice of divinity in our own lives. We know what's best for us. We know how God needs to bless us. And yet, the abundance of God is not measured by what we hold in our hands, but rather by what holds on to our heart. And never more true than when we talk about emotional abundance. How to deal with how you feel. Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, a verse of scripture that you are very familiar with, but if I might just read it perhaps the way Jesus might have read it with more of the emotional intonations than the King James might not already suggest to you. Let me read it for you in the way in which I think he might have said it. It's found in Mark chapter 12. It says, the most important commandment. Jesus says, come here, come here, come here. Come here. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. The most important it's more important than anything else. There's a lot of commandments out there, of course. But this one, this is the most important one. So listen here. The most important commandment is you must love. You must love the Lord your God with, with all of your heart. Not a bit, not a part, not a piece, but, but with all of your heart. Hear me now if you want to please God. Jesus says to his disciples, he says to you and I, the most important thing is that you love, oh, that you love God. You love God with all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. If we could only read the scriptures with the passion and the emotion that I think Jesus might have conveyed when he had these signature moments that he was speaking with his disciples. Jesus is saying, I don't want you just to kind of love me. I don't want you to kind of like me. I want you to love God. I want you to love me passionately with all of your heart, with all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. In other words, God wants to have an emotional relationship with you. He doesn't want to have just a head knowledge of you. Yeah, I know about Jesus. Yeah, I know about God. I mean, I, I saw Bruce Almighty, so I've got it all figured out. <laughs> God says, no, 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 you don't understand. I want an emotional, passionate relationship that is full of feelings with you. In the same way in which you have horizontal or physical and, and emotional and passionate relationships with one another here on this earth, Jesus is saying, I want to have that same kind of emotion with you. God says, I want you all in. I want you emotionally all in. We, we say that sometimes when we're looking for a commitment out of one another in our relationship, and we'll say, are you all in? God says, I want you emotionally all in today. Good. And if you want to experience my emotional abundance in your life, it requires that we be all in. Good. And it's important because God has emotions today. Many people don't realize this. In fact, the only emotion they think that God has is one of anger. So they say, well, I, when you think of God, what do you think he's, he's saying to you? Or what do you think God would feel to me? Well, I think God's mad at me. God's mad, God's angry. And, and, and yet that's an emotion. 
I want you to know today that God has emotions. He feels grief. He feels joy. He feels pain. He feels hatred towards sin. God gets frustrated. He gets frustrated with you and I. He gets frustrated with the world. God has emotions. In fact, the only reason why you have emotions is because you're created in the image of God. God has emotions and therefore you have emotions. If God wasn't an emotional God, then you wouldn't have any either. We'd all be Vulcans. <laughs> Feelings are a gift from God. It might not always seem that way. Even the negative emotions that you feel in your life, emotions motivate us, emotions move us, emotions make us different than any other species on the earth because we feel. Without emotions, life would be like black, like a black and white movie. Emotions bring the color. When people suffer from depression and they're put on certain medications that, that, that control the emotions, they'll say, I just feel bland, I feel blah. I, I, someone will tell a funny joke and I just stare at them because I know it's funny in my head, but, but I've got no laughter in inside of me. Who wants to live a life like that? I understand that, 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 that without emotions, life is just blah. God gave you emotions for a reason. Jesus said he calls us to worship in spirit and in truth. God wants you to worship him emotionally. He wants you to feel it. In fact, if there are no feelings, God has a charge for us against that. And in Isaiah 29, he said, These people come near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In other words, their emotions are far from me. They worship, their worship of me is based merely on human rules that they have been taught. Jesus repeats it in, in Matthew chapter 15. In other words, if you don't really feel it, you don't really mean it. I mean, think about it. Who of you would want to have an emotional, deep relationship with an individual here on this earth, but lacking in the feeling? In other words, it's like a, one spouse says to the other when they say, do you really, do you love me? Do you, do you love me? And the, and, the, and the one spouse turns to the other and says, look, 25 years ago I, when we got married, I told you I love you, and if I changed my mind, I'd let you know. Who of you parents, if you had a five-year-old or a six-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old and they would say, Mommy, Daddy, do you, do you love me? Would say, look, you know I love you. Quit asking that. What a dumb question. Don't be so stupid. You wouldn't do that, would you? How many are grateful that God is an emotional God and God wants us to connect with him on an emotional level? People come to church and they're looking for emotions. Some people want too much emotions. They, they come to church and if they haven't been enraptured in this moment of worship, then they haven't been worshiping. And, they, and, and I'm not saying that you have to jump on your head, yell or scream or shed buckets of tears when it comes to your worship, but, but uh, understand today there has to be some emotional response. But you can make emotions an idol as well. And so there are some extremes to emotions, but, but to understand today that God wants an emotional, passionate relationship with you. He, he wants you all in. He wants you all in because God is all in. God is all in emotionally. When he gave his son, he says, you know what? This is how in I am. I'm giving my son. I'm all in. And he says to you and I today, I want you emotionally all in. And I would suggest to you today that you are never going to fully understand the exceeding abundance of emotional blessing in your life today if you're not all in. And so as we look at this idea of being all in emotionally, the question begs, what keeps us all out? What is it that keeps us out of a relationship, out of being all in? What is it that keeps God there? When you consider some of the relationships you have human-wise with your friends and your family and, 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 and with your sisters, your brothers, or your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, or your husband, or your wife, or your kids, what, what is it that keeps them there? I'm not going to let them, I'm not going to let them in here. Just, that's as far as you go. What is it? Well, when I consider it very quickly, I, I, my first thought was sin. Sin keeps our relationship with God, our, our emotional abundance with God. Sin keeps it right there. It doesn't mean that we don't have a relationship with God. We can have a relationship with God, but sin keeps it there, doesn't it? I'm not talking about the sins that we don't want to have. I mean the sins that we permit. You see, we're in a world today that doesn't believe in sins. We don't like that word sin. See, ours is a world of mistakers. Right. We're not sinners. 
Because sinners is kind of icky, isn't it? Sinners is kind of a convicting word. Sinners kind of makes you feel bad. And ours as a world doesn't want to feel bad anymore. So we, we call it as we're, we, it's not sin, it's a mistake. The problem is, is that we have all kinds of mistakes that we do all the time. Some of us are purposely mistakers. And then if we're caught with the mistakes, especially if we're a prominent figures, you've heard this before, uh, I deeply regret my actions. <laughs> it was a mistake. No! God give us the courage to call it what it is. It's sin, and sin keeps God right there. Right. Nothing will suck the emotional energy out of your relationship with God than sin. Some of us have a terrible sin problem. Because we've been justifying and excusing and allowing in our lives and we're wondering, why am I not experiencing God's emotional abundance? Why, are, why is this, my heart, not rich and full and joyful? And, uh, you know, when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, actness, uh, kindness and meekness and, and all of these things, why am I not experiencing that abundant emotion? Don't have to go any further than sin. I think not only sin, but its counterpart is a result of which is shame. Shame keeps you from God's emotional abundance. Shame is what we feel when sin becomes more than we can bear. And nothing will pull us apart more emotionally when it comes to our walk with God than having a moral system of belief and practicing something totally different. And that's one of the greatest challenges that you and I, that's what one of the greatest challenges that we have in the church today is because we have a belief system that we're not following. Right. We have a belief system that we're not walking in. We have a belief system that we're not adhering to. We say it, but we don't do it. And it produces shame. It produces shame. I think stress, in a very practical way, I think stress keeps us from experiencing God's abundance. And, and stress is really can be boiled down in, in what I'm talking about today. Stress can be boiled down to simply this, living by somebody else's priorities, living by somebody else's rules and regulations, living by somebody else's standard, jump, jumping through somebody else's standards, trying to please somebody rather than whom the only person you should be trying to please and that is God. And when you're trying to please somebody other than trying to please God, that will produce stress in your life and that will keep you experiencing the abundance because you're trying to be something you're not. Or self-effort. Trying to do this whole thing all on your own. The Bible says that there is a way that seems right unto a person, but its path leads to what? To destruction. This idea of trying to do the right thing the wrong way or walking in the wrong way and, and justifying or trying to say, you know what, I can figure this out on my own. Or hopelessness, and I'll be speaking more about hopelessness as we look next week at, at, at direction and, and purpose and finding God's purpose for our lives in an abundant way. We need to remind ourselves today when it comes to managing our emotions that feelings are deceiving. My feelings are often unreliable. My feelings can, can lead me in the right direction. I, I don't know how many times I've talked to individuals and they find themselves in a terrible set of circumstances and, I can, and, and, and you're trying to be gentle with them but you're, 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 everything inside you goes, what were you thinking? And they're like, I thought I was doing the right thing. It just it felt right. Well, you can feel right and still be wrong. Do you know, understand that today? We have a whole world, a whole generation of people that are, that are living their lives because they feel that this is the right way to do it. And, and they're not listening to what the scriptures say. They're not listening to the voice of the spirit. They're not listening to the wisdom of those who are older or wiser who have gone before them. They're just living their lives because they feel that this is the right way to do things. And they don't want anybody to tell them that it's wrong. They don't want anybody to give them any direction. And they certainly don't want to listen to God or what, or what the scriptures would have to say. And when it is pointed out to them, they say, who are you to judge me? Don't you judge me. You can't judge me. Feelings are deceiving. Yeah. And uncontrolled feelings have a no safety net. When those feelings are out of control there's, and, and you collapse by those feelings, there's nothing to catch you. Proverbs 25 says, like an open city with no defenses is the man with no check on his feelings. Let me say that again. Like an open city with no defenses is the man with no check on his feelings. 
If you have no check on your feelings, you have no moderator, you have no governor, you have no manager. He says you're like a city with no defenses. And Satan's greatest tool in manipulating your life is to get you to drop your fences, your defenses. He'll use fear to paralyze you, resentment and jealousy to mess with your relationships. He use, uses bitterness and worry and anxiety and shame to beat you up. And if you don't know how to manage your emotions, Satan will. That's good. You okay out there? If you don't learn how to manage your emotions, Satan will manage them for you. You have to decide today who's going to be at the helm, who's going to be in that little room, who's going to sit at that control panel. I would suggest to you that every any time you let anger or joy or, or, or resentment or grief or disgust or any of those little munchkins at the control panel, you're in trouble. We need to be reminded today that God is glorified by our example. People are watching our emotions. Yeah, it's good. We're being watched. The whole world is watching us. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you need to know that when you leave this place, in fact, you don't even have to leave this place, they're watching you in here. We're being watched. We're watching one another. We're watching the emotional responses. Some of you are going through some difficult circumstances. Some of you go through some very, very difficult circumstances. And, and some of us are spouting off. Some of us are abandoning. Some of us are getting angry. Some of us are letting all kinds of emotions get away with us. And the problem is, is little people are watching. Right. Weaker people are watching. Unbelieving people are watching. We are a watched people. And whether God is glorified or not has a great bearing on whether or not we are in control of our emotions or whether Satan is in control of our emotions. Because God cannot be God in my life if emotions are God in my life. God cannot rule my life if emotions are ruling my life. Jesus can't be Lord of my life if, emo if emotions are Lord of my life. And if I make all of my, simply, my decisions simply based on how I feel, then I have made my feelings God, and then God can't be God. Come on. Don't believe me? Romans 8 says, To be controlled by human nature results in death. To be controlled by the Spirit results in life and peace. Those who obey their human nature cannot please God. Self-control is essential. It's absolutely essential then. People get lost and die because of their foolishness and lack of self-control, Proverbs says. One of the number one predictors of success and failure in your life is whether or not you learn how to manage your moods. You thought it was university education. <laughs> you thought it was a strong work ethic. You thought it was luck. You thought it was networking with the right people. I can tell you this, the person who is in control of their emotions always wins. You can have all those other things, but if you're a cannon, if you're going off at the handle, if you're always resentful, if you're a crier or a powder or a whiner or a complainer, hey, nobody wants to work with you. Nobody wants to employ you. Nobody wants, hang on now, you ready? Hold on. Nobody wants to marry you. Nobody wants to stay married to you. I'm not saying they should divorce you. I'm just saying sometimes the reason why you've got so many problems is because you're not in control of your emotions. It's really quiet in here, Pastor. <laughs> Maybe we should sing something that'll make us feel better. <laughs> so what about our emotions? How do we find God's best emotionally? I think first of all, we need to ask God to forgive our guilt. I know this might sound really, really simple, but when was the last time you just got down on your knees and you said, oh God, forgive me of my sin? I know that's not popular these days. We'd rather say, oh, I'm sorry for my mistake. That's so much easier. We can all do that. 
I could get you to turn to one another right now and say, just, you know what, I want you to say you're sorry for all your mistakes. Anybody can do that. Shoot, I'll do that. When was the last time in your guilt you quit trying to dismiss it? And I'm talking to believers here, okay? There may be some unbelievers here, and if, you, if, if you've never done this before, then I would, I would encourage you that you don't even begin the path of what we're talking about today until you enter into relationship with Jesus Christ, and you can't enter into relationship with Jesus Christ until you acknowledge that you can't do life without him because of sin. Because sin separates us from God. Sin is what produces the shame. Sin is what messes it all up in the first place. But if I might just talk to those who are in the room here that know this, when was the last time you just said, God, please forgive me again? You see, there's two problems with guilt. One, we have plenty of it. And two, we can't seem to get away with it. It's like a hunter after its prey. The world so desperately wants to dismiss it. No one wants to be judged. No one wants to be condemned. So much of what we considered 20 years ago was so wrong now is excused, justified, and it's even glorified. We live in a world that's trying to eliminate guilt altogether by pretending not to feel it anymore. Just stop feeling guilty because it's all good. We deny it. We bury it. We minimize it. Compromise it. Rationalize it. The problem is, is none of it works. You have to go to God and say, God, forgive me of it. Yeah. What about our grief? You see, not all of the sin, not all of the bad stuff that's, that causes all these emotions are at our own hands. See, not all the things in life that damages are the things that I bring on myself. A lot of it is, but not all of it. Sometimes I grieve because of things that are done to me. Sometimes I am grieving because of things that I have seen done to other people, people we love. And we remind ourselves today that this is not heaven, this is earth. It's imperfect down here. And there are going to be days when you're lonely. Right. Days when your heart is going to be broken. Days when you are going to feel despair and feel all alone. And there'll be loss and there'll be grief. And if you identify those, with those emotions today, I want you to know today that I am sorry that you're hurting. I am sorry that you are hurting today. And I want you to know that God is sorry that you're hurting today. And he knows what you're going through. But at the end of the day, only Jesus Christ can fill the emptiness in your heart. When your heart is breaking, David experienced that. In Psalm 31, David said, Lord, have mercy because I am in misery. My eyes are weak so much from crying. My whole being is tired from grief. Have you ever been there before? See, David knows what that was all about. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, David had had an affair with a woman and in order for him to have the affair, he actually had to order the death of her husband. How corrupt was that? He orders the death of her husband in order that he might sleep with the woman and, and, and that became, it's made public. He confesses his sin, his, his guilt is before the people. He asks God to forgive him and he is restored and, and, and that's a wonderful part of the story but there's another part of the story that isn't, very, that isn't talked about a lot and that is that Bathsheba got pregnant. Bathsheba got pregnant, and when the baby was born, the baby was very, very ill. The baby was desperately ill, and what was the first thing that David did when he prayed before God? God, I did this. I sinned. I did all of this. This baby did no wrong. This baby is innocent. God, don't take my sins and place it upon this baby. Lord, heal this baby. Don't let this baby suffer. I'm the one who did this. Don't do this to the baby as if somehow God was up to doing this. He prayed, he fasted, he tore his clothes, and the baby still died. David had to learn to accept the things that, that could not be changed. Some of you have been hurt. You've been hurt by your parents, by peers, and all the grieving in the world is not going to change the past. And I'm not trying to suggest that you should bypass grief. I'm not suggesting that at all. But some of you have been grieving and grieving and grieving so much so that the grieving is the def defining of who you are. There is a time to grieve, the lemon, er, Ecclesiastes says, and then there's a time to close the door to grief. And there has to come a time where you accept that that which was not what you had planned, not what you'd want, not what you had prayed for, but you come to the places, I'm going to stop blaming everybody. I'm going to stop blaming God. I am going to let this go. And to put it in perspective, to not exaggerate it, but to give it to God. 
remind ourselves today that pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. Pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. You choose. You choose. You put it into perspective and realize that you're not the only person that is suffering, not the only person that is hurting out there. We are in a lost and dying world, and because of that, bad things happen to people. And for many of us in the church, we think that somehow we're supposed to be immune, that somehow, that somehow a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, is this, is this uh, shell that says, nothing bad can ever happen to me. And when it does, God, how could you do this? Where were you, oh God? I am a Christian after everything that I did for you. I see so many people disillusioned and emotionally lacking the, the foundation and the wisdom and the maturity that God wants for them to have in their life because they don't understand that this was not God's prescription for them. This is not what God wanted for them. We are in a lost and dying world and bad things happen to good people. And that we're called to focus not on what's lost, but what's left. And that when we cannot find a way to trace the hand of God, when you don't understand what the hand of God is doing, you trust the heart of God. There's been so many times in my life when my, things have been just not going and I don't understand why God is allowing this, why there's this suffering, why there's this pain, why there's this loss, and my, my heart is overwhelmed and I want to, on one hand I want to shake my fist at God and the next minute I want to crawl onto his lap and just say, why is this going on? Why did you let this happen? When I don't understand the hand of God, when I don't understand the actions of God, I have to trust the heart. That God doesn't make mistakes. That God is sovereignly in control. That God loves me no matter what. And that somehow God can bring about something beautiful out of this. My time is gone. I have to give way to grace with my grudge. See, grudges come from what other people have done to me. I may feel guilty of what I've done to others, but a grudge, anger, resentment, bitterness, all of those things are what somebody has done to me. And how I handle those resentments is, is so important because if I don't handle the way in which a person hurts me, then I continue to allow them to hurt me over and over and over again. And I've talked in the past about this, that, that when you find yourself rehearsing the event... That's why the Bible tells us to take every thought captive because when you find yourself, you're saying, well, I, I don't know how to let it go. Or you're telling the story over and over again. When you replay the incident over again, when you replay the transaction over again, and they did this, and then they did this, and then this, or when you find yourself plotting, if they did this again, boy, I'll tell you, I'd be doing this, and I'd be doing this. When you start to let your daydreams take over, you're going to lose out in God's abundant best for your emotions. Remember, what happens in you is more important than what happens to you. And God will take that which has happened to you. And if you will let him, he will produce something emotionally in your life that you could never do on your own. He could actually make you a child of God. Finally, you need to face your fears with faith. Isaiah says, when you go through deep waters and great trouble, I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown, even though you feel like you're drowning. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you, even if you feel like they will. Don't be afraid, for I'm with you. We remind ourselves when fear takes over and we're paralyzed, God walks with us. Remember that when we're weak, he is strong. You can feel like you're the weakest person in the world and wonder how in the world I'm going to get through this. It isn't about your strength. It's about his strength in your weakness. And some of you need to stop trying to be strong in your own strength because you don't have enough gas in your tank. And let God be strong for you. And remember that God is good. And that God in some way has a plan to bring beauty for your ashes. Joy, joy instead of mourning. Praise instead of heaviness. God wants to do this in your life. So would you close your eyes with me this morning? What are you feeling guilty about? 
for those who are new, or this isn't always the way we end a service like this, so. But is there sin? I know you, you don't, we don't talk a lot about this, but it just needs to be said. Once in a while, you just gotta, you just gotta do business. Every once in a while, you just gotta get honest. Is there some sin that you just got to call it what it is? And don't minimize it or justify it or rationalize it or deny it. You know what? I'm sinning. I'm not mistaken. I am sinning. And I need to repent of it. Or there is so much shame because I've been sinning for so long, all along, thinking that it's not sin. Or your heart is broken today. You're absolutely grief-stricken. And you have been trying to, you've been, you've been shoving it all down. Because everybody, you think everybody thinks that you should have a big pasty Christian smile on your face, but inside you're broken and you're so, so full of grief. Or you're angry. Who are you angry at? Either you're lashing out at everybody else because you're angry at someone else or you're lashing out at yourself and you're hurting yourself because you're angry at someone else or you're holding it all in and you swear you're a box of TNT and you're ready to go off and you're absolutely terrified to let it all out because you're not sure what you're going to do if it ever did. Who are you angry at? God wants to heal these emotions are feels, fears ruling, ruling your heart? Are the decisions consuming your heart and your mind? As we've been saying all along, God's abundance is not measured by the things that you hold in your hands, but by that which holds onto your heart. What's holding on to your heart today? I want to pray with you. And then in a minute, we're going to dismiss the service and there will be some people that just need, as I often say, they need Jesus with skin on. As I said a couple of weeks ago, Jesus, when it comes to these things, Jesus isn't enough in the sense that Jesus gave us the church. He gave us one another because he knew that we would need the presence of Jesus in the life of others we need a hug. We need somebody to say, yeah, you are forgiven. Yeah, we can hear that from Jesus. I understand that. I, and I'm not, I'm not advocating a Catholic tradition, but sometimes we need to confess our sins. That's biblical. And hear those words. You know what? I want to assure you today that you're forgiven. Sometimes we just need to let the anger and tell somebody else, I am just so angry. Or we need to tell somebody, I am so afraid and I don't know where to do with it. I don't know where to go with it. I, my heart is so broken. I just need to tell somebody today and, and I just need Jesus with skin on. I, I want to give you that opportunity today. So I'm going to pray for you. And then we'll let you, who need to, who want to, to come and, and to pray with some people. So Lord, we pray for those today who are struggling with sin. And Lord, they want to be emotionally in control. They want to experience your abundance, but they're just wondering, why, why can't I be free? It's because there's sin, and today I confess my sin to you. God, I need to get free. I need to be, rem I, Lord, I gotta be free of this shame. I can't even look myself in the mirror anymore. Lord, I'm so heartbroken. My, my grief is so deep today. Would you please heal my broken heart? I have been hurt. I have been wounded. I am hurting for others, and I don't understand why they're going through this, and my heart is breaking, and I wish they weren't going through it, and I feel like I'm going through it with them, and I'm just so broken inside. God, I'm so angry. I'm so angry. I could just, I, I, I could just punch a wall out. But I'm tired of it hurting me. It's consuming my life. It's consuming my, my thought life, my, my daydreaming. I, I just keep playing it over and over and over and over and over in the head. I just can't stop it. Please, 
please would you help me? Lord, my fear is holding me back and I, I, I can't go forward. I want to go forward. I want to walk in victory, but I just can't. Lord, would you help us today? Lord, today's message would just not be another message that just says, suck it up. Because when it comes to issues of our emotions, it's deep, it's tough stuff, it's hard, it's overwhelming, and we know we should be handling it better, and we're not, and that, even that in itself scares us. So Lord, I pray that in your power and in your love and in your tenderness and in your grace and your mercy, mercy through your son, Jesus Christ, would you come and would you heal our hearts? And bring to us the emotional abundance that you desire for each one of us. I ask this in your name. Amen. You see, folks, I'd be reminded today that our faith in God is not a happy pill. Emotional abundance comes with some, just some deep work sometimes. And we need to process that. So there's some friends that are here and they'll just pray with you if you need to and you don't even have to tell them your name but you just need to get some stuff out. It's safe here. Why don't you just leave here, pray with somebody, leave the junk here and walk in freedom and newness. I pray God's abundant emotional blessing on your lives this day. Amen and amen.